Hello, one and all. Come one and all to a beautiful show, a beautiful damage report Friday show with me. <laughs> you don't know what I'm referring to because it's a sunny thing and you refuse to watch all of it. But anyway, uh, Brett Ehrlich, welcome. How you doing, buddy? Welcome. Hi, I'm well. And I'm really happy to be here with you, John. There is no way I would rather be contractually obligated to start my day than by appearing on the damage report because of that life debt I owe you. Obligated because we don't have contracts. And I'm honestly shocked that you've kept doing as long as you have. Well, thank you for doing that. Glad to have you here. What are, what are your other contractual obligations coming up later today, Bert Ehrlich? Later today, I will be feverishly producing because Fridays are the hardest day. Um, They're pretty the tough, yeah. Helping people's shows happen. Um, then, what am I doing? Oh, happy half hour's fun. <laughs> happy, happy half, half hour's happening today? No, it's not. You're right. Common room is happening today. Get Can't keep it together. I'm not here Monday through Wednesday, so I am beep, 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 checked out. Get it together. Okay, okay what's beep, happening in Common Room? Common Room today, I will tell you one thing about it. Common Room today is myself, my illustrious wife, the Brooke Marks. Uh I, I'm saving the best for last of these last two. Adiana, and I just said my wife's not the best, and I realize that now, <laughs> and I will apologize <laughs> later. Adiana Vega, former TYT intern. Um uh-huh. And then, and also like frequent person that we rate on Twitch, and also uh, Bartman, mm. or Kyle, on but the panel. Don't, It'll be great. I want to give you a piece of advice. Don't bring up Star Wars. Uh, he's already told me that he will publicly drag you <laughs> on the show, all behind your back, really. Even though you, well, he knows publicly. you won't be there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's like, well, okay, can we talk that's, about Empire fun. for okay, a second. God. Yeah, because what the world needs is someone to make the case for the Empire Strikes Back. That little known indie film that nobody seems to like. Anyway, uh, that'll be fun, I'm sure I'll watch. Um, That's happening, you know what else is happening? Not like later on, you know what's happening right now other than the show? I'm rethinking my life choices. Equally important, Um, Mm -hmm. you should, no, you're locked in contractual obligations and all that. Uh, No, what's happening right now and all day is a very important birthday of Marissa. Now, some of you have heard me do one of a couple things. Either refer to Marissa, who along with Sophie, who's producing this show right now, are the two producers for the damage work. You might have seen me in a way that sort of breaks the fourth wall and they never allow on cable news, just talk directly to her when you can't see her or hear what she's saying sometimes. But anyway, it's her birthday. Happy birthday, Marissa. Uh, really fast, just so you know a little bit about how awesome Marissa is. So uh, Marissa uh, got hired to be a producer when uh, former producer Sophie, uh, owner of an awesome Instagram corgi, uh, moved on. And she got hired like a week before the pandemic. So not only was she starting a new job, but she had moved cross country for that job, had like Three days in studio, and then, oh, by the way, see you in a year. And so that's a very difficult circumstance to start a new job and a new life and a new part of the country in. But she has been absolutely awesome. If you enjoy anything about the show, and especially the fact that it still sort of runs, a lot of that's due to her. And so just awesome to have had her for the past year and hope that she's having a good birthday. I really hope that she's not seeing this right now because no birthday should be spent <laughs> listening to this. But anyway, <laughs> hope that it's awesome. Why? That is the most jod to roll a nice thing to say. Here's why, A, it's genuinely nice. All of it's genuinely nice. All of the attempts to like be nice are gen- come from a very real place. But also there's this like instinct for self deprecation in John because he doesn't want to like be too like, over, you know, bearing. And so he'll try to self deprecate himself, but he will say things like, if the show sort of runs while talking about the producer who makes it run quite well by all accounts. So, uh, what I was referring to is, for instance, the intro to this show, there's some issues with that. She's not responsible for that. That's me and that's you. But anyway, um, happy <laughs> birthday, Marissa. Shut up, Brett. <laughs> Happy birthday, Marissa. There was some other stuff I was gonna say, but now I don't remember. But anyway, again, hopefully she's not seeing this. 
Um, by the way, if you want to tweet at the damage report so that she'll hopefully see that, uh, please tweet your favorite photos of frogs and or toads. And that will give her a nice little fun uh, natural world boost on her birthday. And anyway, with that, I think we have some stories, I think. Because again, the, sto- the show sort of runs. So we're gonna be talking about a lot of stuff uh, about the minimum wage, about the pandemic. We're gonna, rem- we're gonna start, I'll, I'll announce it when we, just keep watching, you'll know about that. But anyway, a little bit on CPAC, what's going on there. And then of course, it's Friday, so we've got a garbage can. This garbage can is quite hungry, and so we're gonna fill it full of human garbage a little bit later on. So you're not gonna wanna miss that. With that, Brett, you ready to do this thing? Indeedy. Okay, well, I'm not, because I didn't yet mention, uh, please hit the like button and share the stream if you haven't already. That would be awesome. If you send us messages, we will respond. We have been waiting on the edge of our seats for a couple of weeks now to find out, will the uh, raise of the minimum wage to $15 an hour by 2025 happen on the COVID aid bill? And now it's looking like even less likely that it will because the Senate parliamentarian has ruled that a plan to gradually increase the federal minimum wage does not fit the complicated rules that govern budget bills in the Senate. Democrats had been bracing for the measure to be removed from the bill, which I love because it sort of implies that there are lots of elected Democrats that desperately want this to happen. I'm, there are some, hmm, they're not like, no, please let us do it. But anyway, some were, and uh, the path to an increase is uh, much more difficult in the Senate, where most legislation needs 60 votes to avoid a filibuster. Obviously, allowing it to pass under reconciliation rules would have avoided that. Senate Republicans are almost uniformly opposed to the plan, and a standalone bill to increase the minimum wage introduced by Senate Budget Committee Chairman Bernie Sanders, and it's still nice to say that, has 37 co-sponsors, which I checked is not the number of Democrats in the Senate, by the way, which not everybody has to co-sponsor something to support it, but it's certainly a show of support. And um, so we're gonna discuss a couple different aspects of this, Brett. But really fast, I just want to remind everyone what it means when Senate Republicans are almost uniformly opposed to the plan. The plan is to give the people who make the least money in the country a little bit more money and every single one of them opposes it. So I just want people to understand that, that this is the party that represents people filled with economic anxiety and they desperately want them to not have more money. Yes, the, so the very easy thing to understand is that Republicans are opposed to a $15 an hour minimum wage. The thing that's slightly more difficult to understand, but for wildly different reasons, is why Democrats have been, why two Democrats in particular are opposed mm-hmm. to the minimum wage being raised to $15 an hour. You look at Chris and Cinema, and you look at Joe Manchin. Joe Manchin, who is being outflanked in his own state by the Republican governor who changed from being a Democrat to being a Republican. So in many ways, he's he's bolder than Joe Manchin in that he actually you know, takes off the sheep's clothing and says, I am indeed a wolf. And that guy, even that guy is like, yeah, we should have a $15 an hour minimum wage. In places like Missouri, where Josh Hawley was able to become the senator, unseating a Democrat, he, that state itself supports a $15 minimum wage. Whenever it's on the ballot, it works. People pass it. Mm. And it, it is so difficult to understand why a Democrat and Republican or a Democrat controlled government of the United States in all three, in all three, two houses of Congress and the the executive branch, why this is so difficult. And the truth is with this, this, and so now it seems like they're at a point not where they have to regroup as a result of a call made by the parliamentarian. They're at a point where they have to decide, do we go forward with the very real thing we can do, which is just say, mm-hmm. thanks for the recommendation, parliamentarian, we're gonna yeah. proceed. And that's why I brought up Joe Manchin Wait. and Kristen Cinema, because under that, According to all analysis I've read and reporting, those two, because it wouldn't go, because it it wouldn't follow the Senate rules, they're out. Mm -hmm. Because they just care about the rules. That's what they care about. They don't have a problem with the policy, except that they also, especially Joe Manchin, definitely have a problem with the policy. They just have a problem with the violation of the rules. That's what it is. And so, what that means, and we're we're gonna make a whiteboard of this. It, It. we just need to make it slightly more explicit. Uh, they are in favor of the rules. So they have their concern about the rules, and then they have their approach to the actual policy. 
and they are choosing the rules over the policy. So I don't think that it is unfair to say they care more about their own modern interpretation of arcane Senate tradition than they do about issues such as raising the minimum wage, providing health insurance to individuals, passing the Equality Act, theoretically, we have to see. Maybe in the next week we'll know. But assuming that all of those things won't be able to pass, a Republican implied filibuster on literally every piece of legislation, and assuming they still will support the filibuster continuing, it is not just they like the rules, it's they value their own interpretation of the rules more than they value delivering on all of these promises that Democrats have been running on for literally years. So but with you're very clear, clear about that. You're giving them the benefit of the doubt that that's actually how they feel is that they are they want to value the rules. Mm -hmm. When every bit of it actually, it's sarcastic. Right, exactly. But yes, right. But yes. it's yeah. That's yeah. that is the nicest you can be. Again, John being the nicest you can be. But that's the nicest you can be to them. When in reality, we all know that there are a bunch of other factors that are going into this. Um, mm -hmm. People like when good things happen to them. I hate to break it to you, but people who don't make fifteen dollars an hour get happier when they make fifteen dollars an hour. And just from a mm -hmm. po purely political standpoint. They, this is such a bonehead move from the Democrats, and they think it's brilliant, which is the most disgusting thing about it. They're like, yes, I have an excuse not to do this thing that I want to do, uh, that, I, that everyone wants me to do. And I've kind of promised them that I would do and is wildly popular. They think this is a great way to like say, it's not my fault, it's their fault. Yeah, yeah. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be. Featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today. And get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. After it was announced that the Senate parliamentarian uh, was recommending that the minimum wage increase not be a part of the bill, again, it's a recommendation. And this person is not a living incarnation of God. In theory, one could oppose the recommendation. The chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, Bernie Sanders, said that in the coming days, he'll be working with his colleagues in the Senate to move forward with an amendment to take tax deductions away from large profitable corporations that don't pay workers at least $15 an hour and to provide small businesses with the incentives they need to raise wages. So in theory, that could be a way to try to push in the same direction, which is something. But uh, sort of as I alluded to in the intro, Democrats could also try to overrule the parliamentarian's guidance, effectively insisting on including the wage increase in legislation anyway, or try to rewrite the provision in a way that adheres to the Senate rules. In 2001, the parliamentarian at the time, Robert Dove, was unceremoniously ousted from his position after Republican leaders found fault with his rulings. I have a feeling they will probably consider the rulings of the parliamentarian to be the most sacred thing ever now. But that is something that could happen. Although apparently Vice President Kamala Harris in a role as president of the Senate would not vote to overrule the parliamentarian according to top White House officials. So she could, and she's previously like you can Google minimum wage increase Kamala Harris. She says that it needs to go to $15, but apparently again, add this to the group of people that best interpretation possible values the rules of the Senate more than giving people the wage increase. So they both desperately need absent a pandemic, but inside of one could definitely use that assistance.
And this is all the result of a, like, let's think about the framing. What has gone down to get us where we are in terms of the framing? Framing The par- parliamentarian is, is looking to see, we're all like the parliamentarian, yes or no, can we, can't we? Look at the history that got us to this point. This is to see whether this applies to the bird rule applies that allows for voting 50-50 as opposed to 60 to 40, right? Or 61 to 39. That whole dynamic is utter, total, stupid BS that is so unmoored from even the theoretical history of the filibuster that it needs to be wildly abandoned right now. Already, the Senate is not a 50, you know, a one to one representation of what people in America think. Already, the Senate overrepresents Republican voices. And, and so, really, a 50 50 vote in a Senate is more like a 60 40 vote in, in the general population. It, it would be the equivalent of a 60 40 vote in the House of Representatives in terms of how they represent the population in America. So to then go and say of that already 60-40 breakdown, I need another 60-40 breakdown. We're getting into like the 80-20 representation of America if it's the Democrat, if if it's the Republicans holding America hostage. Vice versa, when it's a 60-40 and the Republicans hold it and they need a 60 person threshold, then it's more like a 50-50 breakdown of the population of America. Mm -hmm. That's what's psychotic about it. And now we're sitting here and the parliamentarian is just one person. Every other major decision is not made by a one judge panel. It's made by a three judge panel or in this case of the Supreme Court, a nine judge panel. Yeah, and we're just going down on whatever her name is. That's like, yeah, I've been doing this since 2012. I read it, I thought about it. Yeah, and and I give her the benefit of the doubt. I look at it, it is not like a slam dunk that just because this has to, you know, the budget would change. Like this is a very, very policy like, um, thing, yeah. But if that's the standard we're holding it to, well, then the tax hike was also against this. The the thing that they've allowed in the past, they shouldn't have allowed. That had it's much bigger BS. budgetary implications. And it's yeah. not just that it has budgetary implications that makes it pass the bird rule. To my understanding, it's yes. it is that is a part of it. But there's specific kinds of budgetary implications. Um, and in this situation, I do believe that it's a mix of the donors. Who uh, the major donors who run companies that fund the politicians, and it's this this just terror that the Democrats seem to have that maybe they're wrong about their understanding of economics. I really do think that's it, and they're really really scared because they've been scared by everyone in their ear saying it's not such a good idea, it's not such a good idea, into believing that um, that they're that they might be wrong and it might overheat the economy. And the last thing is the minimum wage right now. The reason that $15 an hour scares them is because we're so behind in raising the minimum wage. Like you'll hear Republicans say like, why is it that when, and it's happened in California when they raised the the minimum, uh, essentially the the minimum wage when it related to full-time employment. um, You'll see see Republicans and, and business owners say, why did the Democrats always double things? It went from a 20 to a 40. It's going from a seven to a 15. Why are they doing it? Well, that's because Y'all fought so hard for so long to make it to make it so unjust right now that when we ask for you to catch up on your back pay to the American people, you're like, well, it's so crazy. Yeah, that would be that's so, how yeah. we feel. You're gaslighting us. Exactly. You could have made it a gradual series of increases over the course of decades. You chose not to do that, thus putting us in a position where to have any meaningful change, in theory, you would have to double it or something like that. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll talk more about the I can talk about the filibuster endlessly. But anyway, really fast, I want to give credit to a few of those who are advocating for a number of different ways that the minimum wage increase could still happen, including Representative Rokana, who will be joining us next Tuesday on the show. We said, I'm sorry, an unelected parliamentarian does not get to deprive 32 million Americans the raise they deserve. This is an advisory, not a ruling. VP Harris needs to disregard and rule a $15 minimum wage in order. We were elected to deliver for the people. It's time we do our job. And Ilhan Omar responded, abolish the filibuster, replace the parliamentarian. What's a Democratic majority if we can't pass our priority bills, this is unacceptable. Exactly, and what the Democrats already have to pass so many hurdles to have even a chance at exercising political power. Um, And I'm not gonna relitigate all of them because we've done it endlessly on the show. 
when they finally pass all of those and based on very specific promises, they are under an obligation to actually make good on them. So hopefully that will happen. That's yes, awesome. and then Congrats. and then just a so little, really fast, final really time. fast. This delays it so much because the House doesn't want to back down. The House is still going to push it through with the minimum wage increase in there. It's going to go to the Senate. The Senate's going to amend it. Then it has to go back to the House with the amendment where the Senate will say, nah, I don't want to have it in there. And so it's 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 just delaying these payments that were originally going to be two thousand dollars, which are now fourteen hundred dollars. But those also are not going to be adjusted for how adjusted for how late the payment is. And in the meantime, it looks Democrat makes Democrats look like idiots because. They have the numbers, they should have the votes, but the people don't have the checks yet and won't for months or a exactly. month. Exactly, and I'm glad that you mentioned that the, the checks are not being adjusted. Thankfully, nobody has additional expenses over and above what they had on the first week of January, according to our government. We are getting closer and closer to the one year anniversary of TYT's lockdown. Most people's lockdown initially happened around a week from that point. And it made me think, you know what, along the way, considering the fact that we're still in this pandemic, it is still doing so much damage and it was as horrendous as it was and didn't have to be. We're going to start looking back on some of the steps along the way that got us to there. Some of the most outrageous decisions, ways of talking about the pandemic. And one of the early ones that I felt like we could not miss was this prediction from Kaylee McEnany. Take a listen. This president will always put America first. He will always protect American citizens. We will not see diseases like the coronavirus come here. We will not see terrorism come here. And isn't that refreshing when contrasting it with the awful presidency of President Obama? Kaylee McEnany, thank you so much. Good to see you tonight. Thank you. As bad as that quote is, and that's what we're gonna be talking about. Is it Trish Regan? Her like, ah, you nailed it, Kaylee. That like end was really condescending from my point of view. Anyway, Brett. Um, isn't it refreshing that we won't be having diseases like coronavirus come here? Isn't that refreshing, Brett? To be fair, she wasn't wrong. There are no real diseases like coronavirus. I mean, it's an unprecedented disease. So yes, coronavirus itself came here, but she didn't say that. She said <laughs> diseases like coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So the undiscovered pangolin born illnesses, who knows? Because I'm not gonna look it up. The other things that are crawling around inside pangolines, they're not gonna come here. And we have done an excellent job, 100% making sure that no other COVID-like diseases, and I know that COVID itself is an umbrella, but we all understand that. No other disease quite like it that's capable of shutting down an entire world will come here. <laughs> and so far, they're 100% right. It was just the one. It was just the one. Do not Google. COVID-19 variants, so it was so just bad. the one, it was just the one. Now look, but those are there made are in going the USA. to be, what's that? Exactly, uh, we're gonna have to figure out a name for this segment. But anyway, this is this is one of the, the most outrageous ones, not just because, oh my God, we've already lost 500,000 people. How could you say that? But how could you have said that, really? Like the idea, I, I understand. She may not have thought 500,000 people will die, or even that at that point, 50,000 people would die. At that point last year, I didn't think anything like that would happen. But the idea that it would not get here at all, that nobody would get sick, that's madness. It's, it's late February, late February 2020, it was in many countries. I mean, it was, it was already here. But I'll, I'll, you know, we didn't know at that point, but it had already spread to so many countries. The idea that it was never gonna get here is madness. And the idea that you could just say that and now ah, what's the difference if it eventually gets here, no one will care. And I guess largely most people don't care about most of these things, but it was just such an, there was no chance that it would end up being true. There was no argument to be made and there was no pushback from Trish Regan. What a mad thing to say on the precipice of this absolutely horrendous year. And so you once again are, you know, really tackling this on the merits of what she said, but I will I can answer your question mm -hmm. as to why she would think it was okay to say this. We all know that she said something that was ridiculous. 
And why would she, and you're kind of asking, why would she think it's true? And mm-hmm. she doesn't is the short answer to that. And why does she think she could say something that's so obviously not true? Because right. of the other thing you're talking about there that Trish Regan won't push back. That yeah. every step along the way, no matter how big the gaffe mistake or intentional evil deed is perpetrated by someone with an R next to their name or someone that they think by siding with them will gain them more viewership or defectors from the other side. The entire Republican and conservative media infrastructure is is set up and incentivizes people to do exactly that, to say things that aren't true and that yeah. later will be laundered. So and it, and it bore out recently. We did a segment on on the Young Turks where we pointed out how the uh, the guy who quit as a police chief of the Capitol Police in the wake of January 6th didn't apologize, or he 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 resigned, and now unapologized, kind of. He kind of he he kind of unapologized and said he regrets resigning. Why? Yeah. Well, look at what happened to Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz did a terrible thing, and and three days later, after it was clear that he lied, Sean Hannity's on there laundering his image, saying you just went and dropped the kids off. Yeah. So let's take a step back, <laughs> wink, and, wink. and there is there is no longer any incentive for anyone to tell the truth or do the right thing or apologize or resign in shame, because yeah. the right wing media infrastructure is so damn shameless. You got Tucker yeah. Carlson on there saying like there's there's no science behind it when there is, he just is saying things. It's nuts. Yeah. Well, and there so that mechanism doesn't exist, and. And it's not going to. I mean, like, you, you can't. Like, if we, if we really, if we got the right people and the right presentation, we'd have some sort of neutral arbiter of what's true, and we could check the facts. No, Republicans hate. They now are incredibly suspicious of and dismissive of the concept of fact checking, because again, like, the idea that everyone would equally want to make sure that their facts are correct. Uh, presupposes that everyone values the truth. And to say that some people don't might sound insane, but I'm like, you know, when someone shows you who they are, believe them, they don't care that what they believe isn't true. And they're not gonna be shamed into believing something else because you prove to them in some way that it is true. But yeah, then that's absolutely insane. You know, we're gonna eventually get into the the stuff that that Trump has said. We're starting off with Kaylee to sort of dip our toes into the water of COVID insanity. But yeah, it it got a lot worse than she was willing to admit, at the very least. CPAC is about to begin. As you can see in that video, they've got a a guest. They got a gold. A literal statue of Trump cast in what I'm assuming is not real gold. It's Trump, it has to be a con fundamentally. But yeah, they've got that. I think we have a, a video that we can we can jump into to see that a little bit better. That was the saddest four more years chant I've ever heard. And I get that people are focusing on the fact that they have created a golden calf. But I I don't think enough people are focusing on the fact that it's wearing American flag shorts, fine. It's wearing flip flops, what is that about? Did you notice the flip flops, Brett? Yes, I did notice the flip flops. I did notice the Vichy tire. Someone was like, I think someone must have started with a Bart Simpson base. (laughs) But I think he might have been a Bart Simpson. But I don't know, he wears shoes, man. Either way, uh, don't have a cow, have a golden calf. <laughs> it's uh, so I'm insane. looking up gold Bart he, Simpson statue. It doesn't look like him. It looks like a Mirac- like one of those like uh, pop art things you see in a museum where it's like a cool cartoon thing, but it's Donald Trump in shorts. When do you think was the last time Donald Trump wore shorts? I or really, yeah. really hope it was many decades ago. It was probably on Epstein's Island. That the the way the face juts forward is really disconcerting. 
like it's it's sort of a brutish caveman sort of thing. Like I get that they almost certainly mean it to be positive in a joking way, but it it feels like it's mocking him. Yeah, it's not. That's the thing is there's no sense of shame and there's no sense of irony. There's there's no mm-hmm. self awareness at all. It is going full golden calf. This is their idol. There are people outside proudly wearing shirts that says cult of 45, mm-hmm. you know, kind of taking it back. They're fine with yeah. it. And I still don't understand why. It is just, I could sum it up why people like Trump with a lot of people like Trump with the sound raw. Like that's it. They just love, they love that he fights and is loud and doesn't do all. I guess this is the benefit of the doubt. Like, the BS decorum and whatnot, but like, I just like when I see projects like this, thinking how long it took the person, how many hours they spent, just going, hmm, "This is gonna be great. <laughs> this is awesome." Yeah, <laughs> yeah because they right. they this want the be. thing. So look, yeah, and so I get that. Like the first layer is people saying um, that that it's a golden calf. I get that, and then the next layer is them. Ha ha, we got you, we trolled you, we know that we made him the villain in Marvel or whatever. We know that the Death Star is a bad one. You don't get that we get that, so we've owned you somehow. But like the thing is, about the golden calf thing, like I don't think that the biblical prohibition is don't do this thing unless it owns the libs. Like you still supposedly believe all that religious stuff that you talk about. John, it is really ironic, which is sick why. Of the process. <laughs> but if you think this is the only thing that they did at CPAC that was a what? wildly tone deaf religious reference, well then, sir, you are wildly off base. Did you know? What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have some graphics. Did you know that it's CPAC? You might have heard of the Tower of Babel, where they build a tower so high it went close to God, and God was like, "That's that is you being presumptuous." And so I will make you speak in a thousand different tongues where you can't understand each other. Well, here's the Tower of Babbling idiots. (laughs) They had a whole tower, and it spoke. It's still going, and it will go forever and ever. So that's the Tower of Babbling idiots. I thought that was Minas Tirith. Anyway. You would, John. I would. I was like, don't put them on Minas Tirith. Anyway, go and on. Then, and then, and that's not it. And, and is it the only Ten Commandments uh, Genesis based? I'm not sure where Babel is, but the Genesis based "Let My People Go" reference. You've heard of the burning bush? Well, they resurrected Rush Limbaugh and had this: the burning rush. <laughs> It spoke for four hours. For four hours. The burning rush spoke for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was easy, the burning part, because he is roasting in the fires of hell. Oh, that would simplify the process. It a was just bit. a live it burns, it was just, but won't it, die. Yeah, it's like it was a, a hologram. Riddle. Hologram straight from the hellfire. Oh my you God. can smell the brimstone. Nice work. Good job. That's anyway, why. Anyway, yeah, I'm sure. That's that's very good. We got we got to post on Instagram. It's now TDR content. Sorry, we're taking it anyway. Um, yeah, I the whole thing is, and in the like, you can do you can do this. You can have a movement that's just based around a combination of owning the lib. I st- I don't understand how any of this is owning anybody. I don't. I know that they think it is. I just I don't get how any of it's owning. Um, and making the statues and the shirts and stuff like that. If fundamentally there are no problems to be solved. You can have a political movement that is just about the pageantry if enough of them are doing okay and the ones who aren't doing okay are distracted by nonsense that has nothing to do with fixing the problems they actually have. And, and shout out to Skip to for realizing. Go ahead. I was gonna say to the extent that they will go along with that, that is why I am so aggressively opposed to the idea that economic anxiety is the thing that truly motivates these people. There is just no evidence whatsoever in terms of political behavior to support that idea. And shout out to Skip for saying it's a Jeff Koons. 
essentially, which is the guy who makes the super shiny balloon animal dogs. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're like yeah. you can't afford one, but you and you can barely afford like the print of a photo of one. Mm -hmm. But it's in every I, I, Airbnb you've ever stayed in. I'm gonna have to look it up. At CPAC, you can expect that one of the big topics of conversation, like we know that Ted Cruz is going to be giving a speech about that. This is cancel culture. It's so important and it's totally not just the same conversation that had been had about political correctness. It's totally a new thing. So what do people actually think about this? Well, Republicans and independents are more likely than Democrats to think it's an important issue. In fact, 19% of Republicans say it's one of the most important issues facing the country. 2% of Democrats, 17% of independents agree. Now, 19% of Republicans, according to this YouGov poll, saying it's a very important issue is admittedly far less than the percent of Republicans who say that things like jobs in the economy at 58% or immigration and border security at 57% or even things like the budget taxes of the federal deficit at 53 are important. So even when you ask them specifically, far more will say things that are actually issues or issues than cancel culture's issues. But I also want to point out that according to this poll, more think cancel culture is an important issue than think the military is an important issue or foreign trade or abortion, by the way. Like the most politically motivating single issue for Republicans in a long time, other than maybe immigration, they don't think that's as important as cancel culture, let alone things like criminal justice reform, climate change, all these things that they don't think are issues whatsoever. I get that. So it, and it's only gonna get more, like it's gonna become bigger in this sort of polling in the future because it is effectively all that they're gonna be talking about for the next few years is cancel culture. So this is, this is not the high point, my prediction at least, it's only gonna get bigger from here. It's so funny that like just every way to look at this poll is hilarious because one way to look at it that like really, you know, is heartening is that at the very least, as much as they talk about cancel culture, when you ask them, they at least have the wherewithal to say, no, 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 jobs in the economy, jobs in the economy, that's the thing I care about. Mm -hmm. But they they do also say cancel culture, which means there's a little shame there. You know, but when they say jobs in the economy, that might just still be like the rhetoric working of like jobs in the economy are getting killed because we care about human beings and that's evil. Mm -hmm. um, what Maybe I also, the only jobs they care about are the ones lost to people who've been canceled. I don't know. <laughs> I also love that this is an admission that like, listen, cancel culture is not important, but I will never stop talking about it. That's an true. admission that they, they never shut up about stuff that's not important. and. Mm -hmm. Cancel culture is is just a way for them to say that even though the entire economy is set up explicitly for us and the way America's written down and, and chartered and, and has played out since its inception has been for people like us, they still get a way, have a way to feel like they're victims and this is it. They still yeah. have this ejector seat for when they're in a conversation and they and they realize that they can't win it. They're saying they be they've been canceled, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. If if they're in a conversation that they can't win, and the conversation is in any way interpretable as being critical towards them, then you're trying to cancel them. And and that that's the final point I want to make. YouGov did this poll, and I like YouGov. I, I like their polls, but I what the reason that I am talking about cancel culture is I feel like. We cannot allow the same thing to happen in our country that happened with the conversation about political correctness, where it just goes on for years. And the right gets to decide what all of that means, what all of the implications are. I want people to understand as fast as possible what this is about. So when I see even you, Gov, say two thirds of registered voters, 69%, nice, claim to be very or somewhat familiar with the term cancel culture or the practice of boycotting people who voice unpopular or politically incorrect opinions. No, that is not, maybe initially that's what cancel culture was. And maybe sometimes that's what people mean when they say it. They always imply that it's something serious like that, that you've canceled someone so they've lost all this stuff. That is not what they mean when they say it most of the time. Every like Ted Cruz will fundraise off of people canceling him over his Cancun trip. He wasn't getting boycotted, he didn't lose any jobs or anything, he was criticized. That is almost always what cancel culture means. Someone spoke out against something. But now we're conflating it with something like a formal boycott. And that is not what it means, that's not how it used. And so long as we pretend that that's what it is, 
then people will take it seriously because we're talking about something serious like a full boycott, people losing jobs. No, that's only one tiny part of it. Any sort of criticism gets lumped under this. And I think it's very important for people to understand as fast as possible what the term actually means in application. Yes, and, and I get it. There's definitely there is a dynamic, a dynamic where people resort to talking points that shuts down a conversation and implies the other person is not worthy of being listened to. And that's a thing. And that's a real thing. And everybody, and a lot of people do it. But just how clear it is to me, to everyone who is a impartial observer and not a either um, beneficiary of the white right, the white right wing talkosphere or someone who just like basks in its warm glow to excuse their heinous behaviors and opinions. Um, they're truly inherently anti-American and evil interests and, and I can prove that. Um, but yeah, it's, it is just a way and they all use it when they, when they don't like hearing an opinion from someone else. They're saying that those people who are trying to either bring just consequences upon me for my actions and, and statements, or uh, th th basically they're saying that I am being made out to be a victim by them so that, that so I can declare myself a victim of cancel culture. When in reality, they're doing the same thing to other people when the shoe's on the other foot. Exactly, yeah, you, you, well, you don't have to decide because there doesn't have to be an equal, like an equal definition. That's the whole point of setting up something like this is to protect you. But anyway, if, um, if impeaching Trump is canceling him, then Marjorie Greene tried to cancel Joe Biden, okay? If censuring him is canceling him, then they tried to they tried to cancel Ilhan Omar. Like, so which is it? Which is they, it? Very specific behaviors either are or are not cancel culture. But again, it's not because if you learn, if you understand anything about this, it's that it is not setting up some sort of standard by which we can evaluate behavior. It is entirely contingent on who is doing it. Republicans doing something is not, from their point of view, anything like a centrist or a leftist doing something. That is bad, that is cancel culture. The exact same behavior done by a Republican is perfectly fine. It's not even worthy of conversation. And they do it all the time. It's like when Marjorie Taylor Greene put up that sign saying, God made two genders. Like that's not what gender means. That's not what it means nope. at all. And they, there is a term. Cancel culture could be a term and could originally have been set up with every, you know, every uh, with the intention of having reason debate using that as a way to identify a trend and then try to build society to a better place from there. But every time that Republicans use the term cancel culture the same way every time Marjorie Taylor Greene uses the word gender, they're just using it wrong. And later when I when when uh, Rand Paul uses the term genital mutilation, he's using it wrong yeah. to make a rhetorical point. Come on guys, 100% that is a Republican move every step of the way. Yeah. If we if we create a term, let's stick by it. But the Republicans, that's the game is always about winning political points and trying to uh, make their base feel good about being awful. I want to make a bit of a prediction about CPAC, and this is based off of what happened with CPAC last year. Remember, uh, there was the beginnings of this international pandemic thing, sort of became a big deal later on. Um, and we knew about it when CPAC was about to happen. They decided they still wanted to pack all these rooms full of people. And what do you know, a bunch of them got COVID. Well, I'm gonna make a prediction about this year's CPAC and it's based off of this clip. Take a look at this. And I know this might sound like a little bit of a downer, but we also believe in property rights and this is a private hotel. And we believe in the rule of law, so we need to comply with the, the laws of this county that we're in. Um, but a private hotel, just like your house, gets to set its own rules. Carly, our CPAC director. Well, as Dan mentioned, we are in a private facility um, and we do want to be respectful of the um, ordinances that they have as their private property. So please, everyone, when you're in the ballroom, when you're seated, you should still be wearing a mask. So if everybody can go ahead, work on that. I know, I, I know it's, it's not the most fun. You, you have the right. They didn't like that. So I'm gonna say my money's on them getting COVID because uh, the sort of people who, they're, they're even being primed. No, 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 think about this from the point of view of private property rights and complying with the law. No, I don't like that. Boo! 
Those sorts of people maybe are not being responsible in other parts of their life. Rule of law in other situations <laughs> and in very Rule selective of law when it time. doesn't when it doesn't inconvenience me briefly. William Turton is a I don't know he's a blue check guy, but he uh, he's reporting from there and he says a staff member flanked by two security guards at CPAC is standing near an exit from tonight's reception event and asking people to put their masks on in uh, following the rules that were outlined by that very earnest uh, and, and sad sad uh, coordinator of CPAC. Watched a contract security guard ask a woman to put her mask on, he says, and she said, okay, and kept walking. Quote, this is a tough assignment, man, the security guard told me. <laughs> yeah, I, that's it. And Ted Cruz walking around with a mask until he's sitting down doing photo ops, pulls it off. Uh, people walking down the hallway when we played earlier the Golden Calf video, half of them have masks on, half of them don't. Mm -hmm. There is, you know, there's no. I get it. The only thing I'm over it. That I know, I know. Pointing out that they're anti-maskers is it's just like, dude, it's like you gotta just get through a couple more months. But anyway, um the I got only it at thing the Trump event. I'm good. I already got it. I already I got it no, at the no. last mask super spreader <laughs> event. So I'm solid. I'm set. I killed that three is, grandparents. That is my too, point. So it, totally, yeah, totally. They were just there was too many grandparents. Um yeah, the the odds that any individual there has already had COVID, I has to be so much higher than the general population. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe that's me in my bubble, but I think there's a very good chance that they've already had it. I want you to take seriously the threat that is posed by the variety of different groups that call themselves militias or the KKK or the Boogaloo Boys. Or There's a lot of these different groups out there. Some of them have been very active recently, including on the 6th the when they attacked the Capitol. Some are planning for violence in the near future. Capitol a police chief is saying that there is an expected attack or at least threats of attack for when Biden does his upcoming uh, address to uh, to Congress, but then they also have plans outside of DC as well. So we're going to talk about one individual, the former leader of the base, a domestic terror group. This is Justin Watkins, who apparently claimed he was going to be purchasing and occupying land in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So this is to set up some sort of white ethno, like fascist state in Michigan, but eventually franchised out to other parts of the country as well. So this organization, if you're not familiar with it, venerated Timothy McVeigh, so that's awesome. Considered one of the most violent American domestic terror groups in decades and was recently designated a terrorist organization by the Canadian government. Since late 2019, nine members of the base have been arrested in the US for alleged crimes as wide ranging as an assassination plot, ghost gun making, plans for train derailments and a mass shooting. And bear in mind, this is happening in the same state where another domestic terror group uh, planned to uh, kidnap and possibly execute the governor of that state. So Watkins, uh, who was communicating on these online apps and eventually that was revealed to law enforcement said, we're buying houses and land and fortifying them. Land is cheap, I'm setting up a community up there, going to have houses set up to get guys moved in that's situated. He said that the Upper Peninsula was practically a white ethno state already given its demographic makeup while allowing that there was a Native American reservation near his planned community. And so we have some more comments, which are just awesome out of this individual. But Brett, what are your thoughts about this planned state within a state? Sounds awesome. I'd love to go visit these Nazis. Um, I mean, like, <laughs> it's so patently, it's there's a lot of ridiculous stuff happening. It's like, why don't you just go live there anyway? Like, yeah. does it have to be like a white ethno state? If they can operate off the grid, fine. I love the idea of saying like, you know, it is it is essentially a white ethno state anyway. I've never been to the ups, uh, the Upper Peninsula, but uh, sure. And then it's kind of mentioned, yeah, there are some Native Americans who were displaced by the white ethno state. Um, yep. But come on, here's what's uh, weird is if any other. I mean, the obvious thing to say that is the most ridiculous thing is if any other group besides a bunch of white people did this. They would lose their freaking minds. They would say there are a bunch of Arabs who are buying up land in Michigan and they are arming it, fortifying it. We need to get in there and liberate America from these people. Mm -hmm. But no, they're just a bunch of white dudes, so it's fine. And it's the same dynamic that has a lot of folks 
saying that this it wasn't a, a terrorist uprising that went to the DC Capitol on January 6th. Even though every definition of terrorism applies to that activity. Well, look, so that's like you you said the hypothetical, like what if another group did this? But remember, I don't remember exactly when it was or exactly which state it was. But there was this conspiracy theory on the right within the last few years that Al Qaeda and other Muslim terror groups were operating training camps in the United States and they lost their minds. They were trying to break into property to unveil the terrorist training camps. But this would be totally fine, you can totally do this. So let me give you some more details about this individual. He said, the faster we can get the guys, the faster we can snowball property grabs, get four plus guys in a house splitting property tax and food and saving up for each of them to buy the next bit of land and move in four more to help like some sort of KKK pyramid scheme. I'll be looking for solid guys. I already got a guy up there. We're already training every single day. And don't you wish you could see some quick video footage of what their training each day would be like? Like what did, are they doing pull ups on a tree branch or something? What sort of pathetic training are they doing? But anyway, um, this is something that they wanted to do. I agree, just go there anyway. You already acknowledge that it's basically just white people. It, like SNL, I don't remember exactly what it was, but they did a thing where this guy went to one of these like militia groups that was talking about setting up a commune or whatever, or like a compound. And he was like, don't just move to Vermont. And he described it and eventually they just went to Vermont because it's basically what they're talking about already. But anyway, the reason why this matters is this one individual, Justin Watkins, he's trying to set up this white ethno state from which they would launch attacks and things like that. But bear in mind, he came on the radar of local media back in June 2020 when he was spotted counter protesting in a local Black Lives Matter rally while carrying a rifle and wearing a skull mask along with others. So look, we've seen these sorts of counter protesters at any number of different protests, generally Black Lives Matter protests. Some of them are just Trump goons, but some of them are part of the KKK or neo-Nazi groups and wanna set up their own white, white ethno state and are desperate for people to start shooting the sorts of people who might be at like a Black Lives Matter rally. So this is still very much serious. I understand maybe you came to this channel after watching Tucker Carlson and he convinced you that white supremacy doesn't actually exist. And even if it exists, it's awesome, it's not a problem. But it's kind of a problem when you have terrorists like this openly operating. I looked up the, uh, I looked up the, the like, Upper Peninsula. Yes, there are, there is a few Native American aspects to it. About 16% of the peninsula is called the Hiawatha National Forest. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, and, and that's the thing is it's, I mean, this story, that is how far gone it is. Like, yeah, it's, yeah. it's just they are saying I'm going to attack and you know, you see a kid with a cell phone, and just because he's black, you're like, he's gonna shoot me. Uh, it was a cell phone, no, it wasn't. But these guys are literally saying, I am setting up an ethno state from which to have a base where I attack things. Exactly. But, uh, it, you're you're impin- you're infringing upon my constitutional rights if you say that's a bad thing. By the way, thank you to Dave Pigott in the super chat for reminding me. I knew this, but had forgotten. Uh, this, so this organization is the base. Al Qaeda literally means the base. Nailed it. But don't make any comparisons. It's the end of the week, and so it's time to take out the trash. Okay, so we've, oh my God, he's starting to throw up a bit. Oh, that was the, the, the young women who dressed up as old women to get the vaccine from last week. Well, anyway, I've got some trash for you. And look, human garbage comes in a lot of different forms. This is one of a person who has been garbage a lot. In fact, was our garbage person of the year last year, I think two years in a row. But this is this is like a personal reason for this one. So my garbage person is Mitch McConnell. And I'm gonna put him in the trash there. And the reason that he is my garbage person of the week is just because he's the sort of politician who's awful in all the substantive ways that we talk about, but also just the personal ways where like, this is a person who's so obviously awful and spineless and dishonest that it just makes regular good people not wanna be a part of this thing, this enterprise of caring about politics. Like I get, I get frustrated when people aren't into politics, but I also get it 
when they are confronted by people like this. And let me tell you what I mean. So back as a result of the second impeachment trial, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell in a speech after he voted to acquit Trump, argued that Trump is practically and morally responsible for the attack and said he could still face legal consequences. So I'm gonna vote to acquit him, but he's totally responsible for it. And Hey, maybe he'll face legal consequences. I mean, he said, we have a criminal justice system in this country. We face civil litigation and former presidents are not immune from being accountable by either one. Stating Trump is still liable for everything he did in office. So Trump is responsible for the attack on the Capitol, might well go to jail as a result of it. Then in response to that, Trump wrote that letter called saying among other things about McConnell that he has a lack of political insight, wisdom, skill and personality. He's dour, sullen and unsmiling political hack. He begged for an endorsement. Democrats play him like a fiddle. They never had it so good. He's got substantial Chinese business holdings, which I think is just an attack against his Chinese wife and third rate leader. That's what he is. So he is responsible for the attack. He should probably go to jail and might well go to jail. And then he attacked him a whole bunch. And then after all of that, take a look at this back and forth in the news. If the president was the party's nominee, would you support him? Uh, the nominee of the party, absolutely. You, ju you just said that he's responsible for the attack. And you think it seems perfectly legitimate that there might be legal consequences afterward. He could end up in jail, but absolutely don't even have to think about it. It's the most obvious thing in the world. It's just so frustrating. That like seemingly not thinking at all about what he's actually saying, what the implications of it actually are. A president that you think inspired an attack that ended up killing people. Oh, you know, totally. I mean, totally. If he was our nominee, I'd totally be down for it. Anyway, so, I'm not gonna be able to hear you because I assumed it would switch over to this one. I'm gonna get my thing, but let's go to one shot of Brett and Brett, give me your thoughts. All right, here we go. So my favorite definition of politics is discourse in the service of power. And that is, and Mitch McConnell is a strictly political animal. And if the definition of politics is discourse in the service of power, he's just being what he always was. They are who we thought they were. You're, and yeah. And I'm just, I'm not excusing it. You're right in all the reasons it's reprehensible, but I'm, ex I'm analyzing the politics. And it's no different than his previous positions anyway. I know, uh, Mitch I know. McConnell is advocating and in his discourse in the service of power, he knows the Republicans know that they have no, their only route toward the, the existing Republican politicians know that their only route in, um, for many of them, their only route to, to maintain the power that they have is to support Trump. The other, because otherwise they lose, and there's not a, the Republican ideas are are worse than the Democrat ideas in most people's minds, yeah. um, and the ones in the middle who haven't like identified either way, that's that that definition still holds. The ones that are uh, affiliated with Democratic candidates are still better in most people's minds than the ideas in Republican candidates' uh, mind, uh, you know, vice versa. So. Mitch McConnell is essentially and has said, yo, anyone who wants to take Trump out, do it. I'm not going to do it, but mm -hmm. you can do it. And if after you trying to do it, it turns out that Trump is the the Republican nominee, I would be totally stupid to do anything but say I would support him because I would lose not only the election, which I'll probably lose anyway, because Trump ended up losing the House, losing the Senate and losing the White House. But I'd be double screwed if I also abandoned Trump. Yeah, yeah, no, everything that you said is 100% right. And none, none of the, the fact that he said it isn't surprising, I get it. It's just, it feels to me like a version of Ted Cruz, like kissing the ring after all that Trump had done. Like but what you want is people who are actually people. We don't have that. We have people like Mitch McConnell and we have people like Ted Cruz. And like I said, it just, I think for a lot of people, it just drives them away that with along with so many other things about the way politics works in America, everyone is just so fake and so spineless and so absent any actual values that mean anything. Like the best you could hope for is sort of performative values. I don't know. This but is this is but this is John, by far not one of the. 
that's poli- that's exactly it. Discourse in the service of power. If they can have, if we can make it the case that they get power by us changing the system so that you have to absolutely go with the will of the people. I mean, that's the goal. That's the only way to get the slimy creatures like Mitch McConnell and, and Ted Cruz to go along with it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Democrats as well. well. Average person is Randall Paul, Randy Paul, Amaranth Paul. I don't know what his name is. Randy Rand Paul. Uh, he <laughs> is further making his uh, father roll over in his non-grave by kind of starting off as a libertarian, but then making it very obvious that he does not want people to live and let live. So here he is talking to, uh, 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 I think it's like the assistant HHS secretary nomination. Nominee as he's grilling her, she's a trans woman. And here is how he approaches the question he has for her. Take it. Genital mutilation has been nearly universally condemned. Genital mutilation has been condemned by the WHO, the United Nations Children's Fund, the United Nations Population Fund. According to the WHO, genital mutilation is recognized internationally as a violation of human rights. Genital mutilation is considered particularly egregious because, as the WHO notes, It is nearly always carried out on minors and is a violation of the rights of children. Most genital mutilation is not typically performed by force, but as WHO notes that by social convention, social norm, the social pressure to conform, to do what others do and have been doing, as well as the need to be accepted socially and the fear of being rejected by the community. American culture is now normalizing the idea that minors can be given hormones to prevent their biological development of their secondary sexual characteristics. Dr. Levine, you have supported both allowing minors to be given hormone blockers to prevent them from going through puberty. Dr. Levine, do you believe that minors are capable of making such a life-changing decision as changing one's sex? Well, Senator, thank you for your interest in this question. Um, Transgender medicine is a very complex and nuanced field. So first of all, he loves saying the term genital mutilation and he loves citing like WHO and uh, UN studies. The genital mutilation that they're talking about is like FGM. It's, it's, it is mutilating the genitals of women so that they cannot ever enjoy intercourse at all. It is horrible. And he is using it as a way to say like, I'm sorry if you have gender dysmorphia. I don't care, and I don't want to, uh, you know, honor the 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 way science is set up right now. The medicine is set up so that we can not shut people down, and and if they are insistent on eventually, as minors still uh, trying to get that, uh, you know, hormone therapy, then we can they they handle it that way. And that set up. Rand Paul is not concerned about that. And then he has the 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 lack of self awareness to say that that it is the people who are willing to be accepting of those who are transgender. They're the ones who are pressuring through social conformity to ruin people's lives. That's what you're doing. Your pressure of social conformity and all these crazy people on the right who are so obsessed with trans lives that they would. They spend all this time berating them and calling them mentally ill and sick, but they're not obsessed with them enough to actually learn what any of it is at all. To come at it from a point where they are actually informed to have that informed discussion. And then I saw Steven Crowder, who's even more garbage, say that no, we need to let them go. We can't give them hormonal therapy. We can't let them become trans because trans people commit suicide at at a huge clip. And it's like, that is not how any of that causality works. No, It's people like you making their life a living hell. It's the social conformity pressure that makes their life a living hell. That that they're just because they didn't get the, the, the surgery or the hormonal therapy doesn't mean that people like you aren't making their lives a living hell. Yeah. So they're they need to stop terrible. it. They're absolute garbage. And and what's worse is I it they they should know better. They don't care. There's some weird horniness that they have for trans people. And and the ones that are loudest and meanest are the ones who are like probably the most interested in it on a sexual level. It is really and and again, that pressure of social conformity is what's making them monsters too. Just let it for for a side of the aisle that's always let people do what they want and live their own lives. Why are they so obsessed with this? I think I know the answer and that's the saddest part.
Yeah, we talked about it a little bit with Rashad Ritchie yesterday. Um, I'm sure it's complex, but yeah, they're they're obsessed. Um, yeah, some of these right wingers have to sort of pretend to be dumber than they are uh, for their audience. I, Crowder's just, he's actually stupid. I'm sure he found that to be a very convincing argument that he was making. But um, yeah, I, I barely even want to like engage with Rand Paul because Rand Paul doesn't care. He's not a concerned doctor, or concerned citizen. This is a useful line of attack for him. He doesn't actually care about it. He's a libertarian, by the way. Just he's everybody not. can do whatever they want. His dad is. No, no, he's, he's totally. not. He is. He yeah. is just super. I mean, what is Rand Paul doing right now? Because he thought he was like right set up to be the president of the United States, and he is yeah. so far from that, and he's never going to get it. Why is he still trying? I don't know. I don't know what the point of him is. Um, yeah, to be this obsessed as an entire political movement, this obsessed with a group of people and have no interest in speaking to a person in that community ever, learning about it ever. Because they don't actually care about those people as people, they care about them as a means to an end. It is a political tool and I'm just so sick of it. I'm just so sick of it. I'm saying I don't even want to like, it's a great garbage person, Brett. I don't even want to talk about it. Sleep on what we have. I'm just so sick. All I right, hate it. I hate it. I hate our Boston. What did, what did the community say? Yes, you're. It's that. That is maybe the best garbage person we've ever had because it makes me so sick. I don't even want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> anyway, this week the community garbage person of the week for TDR was chosen as the result of 46,000 votes, which I think is the most we've ever had. That is crazy. But anyway, we gave you five great garbagey people. And coming in this week at number five with 4% of the vote is Megan McCain for blatantly showing her elitism. I, Megan McCain, Princess of Arizona, co host of You Should Get the Vaccine Immediately. Um, number four. <laughs> exactly. No, number four with 5% of the vote is Newsmax for attacking Biden's dogs. I forgot about that. That was crazy. Uh, number three with 14% of the vote. Uh, is Joe Manchin for opposing the $15 minimum wage, very timely for what's going on right now, actually. Uh, number two, with 20% of the vote, is Marjorie Green for mocking her colleague's trans daughter, that's uh, Representative Marie Newman. She's number two, which leaves number one with 58% of those 46,000 votes, Texas Energy Companies for capitalizing on people's pain and charging them whatever they can. That is true garbage. Those energy companies were garbage before this, but it really is obvious when the emergency hits. So thank you to everybody who voted on that. Um, thank you to people who want to uh, join the Texas energy companies with being garbage. Like I believe it was the uh, Attorney General of Texas who said, should have read the fine print. Woo. Woo, that's a thing to say. But anyway, a lot of garbage to go around. Thank you to everyone who voted and thank you everybody who watched the show today. Thank you to Brett for being on the show. Brett, thank you so much. See you in common room, uh, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash TYT. I thought at first you were talking to me. I was like, wait, I'm doing it. But anyway, it's going to be awesome. Everybody tune in later. Brett, I will see you in five minutes on our production meeting call. And thank you to Sophie for putting up with it. Sophie, who's been doing this for the last four minutes. And oh, I, think I can't we might see make her because emote. of the garbage can. <laughs> we might make an emote out of Sophie going like this. Like, you guys, sorry. you guys. <laughs> Sophie emote incoming. Anyway, uh, okay, so we'll go then. Bye, Brett. Thank you everyone for watching today and throughout the week. Really do appreciate that. Lots of plans for next week, including our, our interview uh, with Congressman Ro Khan about the future of the US involvement in the war in Yemen. So you're not gonna wanna miss that. I will be leaving the first hour of the Young Turks later on today. So definitely be there for that as well. And until then, stay safe out there, stay sane out there. I'll see you soon. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.